The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to Talk Cosmos, the show where Sue Rose Minahan and guests unveil astrology's ancient archetypes that continually build the collective experiences in our unconsciousness. Get ready to find your free will from your roots in the stars. Hello, once again, Talk Cosmos, and today, tonight actually, is Saturday, January 26, 2019, and we're beginning a new archetype of Aquarius. And I'm glad for all our listeners. As always, it's great to welcome you. And tonight's subject is Aquarius Black Moon Lilith. Actually, Lilith, as we will learn, has many forms. It's an enormous energy and archetype. But most interestingly, it's because it's in Aquarius, it's transiting our natal new moon. Perhaps not everybody's aware, although astrologers often, that the United States natal moon, there is a chart for countries and businesses, anything, is 27 degrees Aquarius. And Lilith transits for an extended time Aquarius, and there are going to be, last year and this year, as she has been transiting Aquarius, a connection, a conjunction with our moon, and in fact, our south node, which is also in Aquarius, it's much earlier at six degrees, whereas, I mean, that's a pretty big distance, but yet there have been many instances in 2018 and now in and, and especially, too, I might say, sticking with 2018, because the nodes, the lunar nodes, as we are transiting in time, we had a lun- uh, nodal uh, conjunction. And not too many months ago, it was six degrees because it goes in reverse. So for astrologers, we know that. For the rest of you, just be aware that there are connections. And like everything, it's forward and backwards and sideways. There's a lot of energetic movement because life is movement energy is one big shift of changes so tonight aquarius black moon lilith transiting u.s natal moon and as it expounds because in 2019 for these numerous months it repeats an opposition to our natal lilith interestingly too so that that means a lot of awareness while it's conjuncting our U.S. natal moon, because we're born, you might say, in this nation with this conceptual energy that we had and rematched in the universe. So freedom for a better future lives in our hearts in this nation of the United States, along with the idea that we're ready to toss aside what hasn't the promise of being better or new, However, the moon, that energy of the moon, that processing, that personal moment, we need personal time to integrate feelings, to remember our ancestral links. And as Tom, one book, there's several books on Lilith. Tom Jacobs wrote Lilith Healing the Wild. And in it, Lilith urges, and I paraphrase what he said, to listen to our body's wisdom constantly giving us messages, telling us if the experiences we encounter are good or not for us, and to stop our conditioned fear, discounting that information. I'm really excited to have met a special astrologer that is in the Seattle area, Madam Simon. She's an archetypal astrologer, a tarot reader, a visionary fine artist, and lives on Bainbridge Island. And she has dedicated her primary research to study Lilith. And Madam Simon blogs astrology and art on her site, iconalchemy.com and Patreon. And you can find all this information on talkcosmos.com under guests, as that will stay there. And she's also as a tarot reader, not reader, 
Reader, Terrell Reader, regularly featured at Ch- Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in New York. For 30, not 30, but I'm thinking 30 years, for three decades. I'm thinking too fast here. If I could just transport this information. But it's important information, and it's in- of interest. She, for three decades, studied multiple wisdom traditions and practiced the div- arts, the divinity. I'm going to introduce her, and she can tell me how to say divination. Divination. I have a tongue twister of a mind. I'm so sorry. Madam Simon, it's a pleasure. Hello. <laughs> Likewise, Sue, and no worries about the tongue twister. <laughs> okay. And would you say that word? Practice divination. Divination, yes. Thank you. Div- divination. Okay, it's the syllables. Well, where to begin? It is in some form of tonight's conversation, I want to talk about Lilith in conjunction with the United States. But first, Lilith herself is such an energy, so primal and important. So what comes to your mind initially, I would be really happy to receive and share with our audience. Well, I think um, first we should uh, get some idea of uh, Lilith's mythology um, and then uh, maybe take a look at, there's actually multiple forms of Lilith in astrology. Um, so perhaps after we could get that initial initial um, uh, yes. mythological basis, and it is then we should look at, at what are the, the various forms we're actually looking at. Great. Um, so um, Lilith is originally a figure from Sumerian mythology, uh, circa 3000 BCE. Um, and, um, she was considered, uh, a, a kind of winged spirit, um, commonly known as Lilu, and there was a whole race of these. Um, Lilith eventually is distinguished as the leader of this race. Um, mm-hmm. but initially, you know, they're, they're, it's just a plural. Um, and, uh, you know, they're described as, as desert spirits, um, a race of vampires who sexually preyed upon humans. Um, Lilith appears um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, as a spirit living in the trunk of the sacred willow that the goddess Inanna wanted to use for her own magical purposes, but couldn't because of the presence of Lilith, along with a serpent entwined in its roots. Sound familiar? (laughs) <laughs> yes, of regeneration. Yeah, right. Okay, and and well, this is also this this uh, sacred willow relates to the tree of life. Yes, um, and and there was also this zoo thunderbird nesting in its branches, and oh, Gilgamesh cuts the tree down, and Lilith turned into a screech owl, and flew off into the wilderness. Um, so right there, we see this archetypal figure of chthonic female divinity exiled by patriarchy. Okay? So that's like the the really ancient roots of the myth. It's, um, and I might, yes, I, I love the way you have described this because I have read, but it, it's just like listening to a great story because also, um, oh boy, here I just lost it. I was just thinking that, that, um, Oh, she was projected upon, you know, when she, when she left, not, and I'll let you finish, you know, not wanting to uh, be told, you know, uh, uh, no, anyway, I will go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so then this, um, this Sumerian myth, um, gets taken up, um, by the Hebrews, um, you know, I suspect in relationship to, you know, the, um, you know, they, they got it from, um, from Babylon, you know, during the Hebrew enslavement in Babylon. So, um, you know, we see some little themes in the early Sumerian stories, but these get crystallized in the Hebrew Talmud, where Lilith is portrayed as Adam's first wife, who would not lie beneath him during sex. Um, and I, I actually would love to read to you this little fragment um, because I've, I've heard many retellings of this story, but there's this just this really evocative okay. version. 
in a little book called Revelations of the Dark Mother, and it goes thusly. Lilith was the first woman, the left to Adam's right, the equal grown from his back, flesh of his flesh. Beside her Eve, the mother of all, is a pale specter. As part of the original two, Lilith inherited magical birthrights and learned great arts. Rightfully, she considered herself the equal of Adam. Like most men, he saw things differently. When he raped her, Lilith appealed to the Most High, which is to say, to Yahweh, who delivered her out of Eden and cast her out into the unformed world. From that point on, it is said, she became a vengeful demon, killing children, stealing seed, and waylaying virtuous men. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yes, well, I'm glad to hear the laughter. It's so true. We have some perspective. And this is actually what I was referring to as the projection, because it's mm -hmm. very easy. I mean, it's a human trait. Well, it, you know, when we, when, by human, I'm saying that the the lower stage of our emotional um, status is to uh, blame, you know, uh, e externally our woes, our troubles onto something. And since somebody has left, they're easy to, easy prey. That's what I'm right. Um, you, right. And this is also, it, it's, it's interesting because this um, really begins Lilith's characterization as the other woman. So she gets associated with prostitutes. Um, she's not only a rejected cons consort of Adam and his descendants, but also of Yahweh himself, um, because she's effectively the woman to whom God turns in the absence of the Shekinah, who is the divine bride that is the epitome of virtuous humanity. Okay? Mm -hmm. So she gets associated with prostitutes, vilified, said to have become a consort of either Lucifer or Samael and to have born demonic children from them. Okay. Which and only now, further, yes, only further uh, is the projection. Yes. Right. Now, here's where the story gets really interesting, though, um, and also really despicable, because Adam whines that Lilith have, has left him. So Yahweh sends three angels to Lilith in succession to persuade her to return to Adam, telling her that they will kill 100 of her children each day if she does not obey. And though it breaks her heart to do so, she cannot betray herself by returning to Adam. And so this is why she's associated with the death of children, because she wouldn't make herself a further victim in order to save their lives. And I find that especially interesting because it speaks of this damned if you do, damned if you don't position of victims of domestic abuse in particular, mm -hmm. who are blamed for their situation, whether they stay or go. Yes, okay? guilty so before Lilith. proven innocent, yes. Absolutely. And Lilith is then, as a result of all this, is blamed for miscarriages and crib deaths um, for centuries thereafter, and is seen as an enacting vengeance against the children of Adam for the deaths of her own children. Enlightening through awareness, just the information of where the roots are is so helpful to be able to dislodge and readdress, put light on the subject, you know, in, in that sense, because... It reminds me, I was, uh, when you say of the desert um, earlier of this, uh, the leader of a race of winged serpents on the desert, I was just listening last night about Tibet, the wild China, and of the, the, the deserts there that are vast and very huge, and that with the Silk Road, you know, of course, back in times, Marco Polo and that did cross it, but what people found out was that the desert sang, that it would confound some travelers because they would think it was their own group and go off trying to search for them. A little bit like, I think, with Trojan War with Odyssey, I believe it is, where the sirens, you know, the S-I-R-E-N, right. as yes, the furies and all that trying to... But the sound of the desert that it sang, I think, is... They haven't yet even scientifically... It was saying, understood how that could happen, although it does. 
So it's mm. sort of intriguing to think I had not realized that she was originally part of this uh, winged serpent, which is again like the snake of regeneration, really. Well, she's a she is a winged figure associated with serpents. She's not the serpent herself. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, uh, that depends upon which telling you're looking at. Yeah. But um, what I find interesting, though, is that since you you mentioned this singing in the desert, it's actually singing or music that um, sort of helped Lilith get this PR boost um, in the late 90s um, via Sarah McLaughlin's Lilith Fair festivals, um, which equated Lilith's rebellion against Adam um, with feminist self-assertion and the suppression of the divine feminine, you know, um, in relation to her, her tribulations. Um, and these were really huge... Um, highly attended concerts featuring female performers. And th it's really there that we see this kind of turning point as a this massive reclaiming of the Lilith archetype from patriarchal demonization. Um, and what I find interesting is that the first of these was in the summer of 1997. And that spring, um, Black Moon Lilith, had opposed the U.S. moon. Oh, I was just going to look that up. 97. Uh -huh. Okay, wonderful. Because that's what it's happening, opposing. Let me see if I can see that. Chart. So, you know, of course, oppositions bring awareness to something in yes. astrology. And so this gave us this heightened awareness of and desire to give expression to this um, previously um, suppressed aspect of divine femininity okay um so yeah as i mentioned that was black moon lilith um so perhaps i should actually explain <laughs> the various liliths in astrology now that we've got a, a mythological yeah page. let's do that let's tell people because there are there's and there's quite a few wonderful books if people are interested there's a wonderful author emma kelly hunter who yes. wrote Living Lilith, Four Dimensions of the Cosmic Feminine. There's also Tom Jacobs, Lilith, Healing the Wild. And the third one is by Delphine Gloria J. Interpreting Lilith. Those are ones I happen to have, but others. So go ahead. Yes. Right. Um, some other uh, wonderful Lilith research has been done by Monica Escalante Ochoa, um, uh, Demetra George, also um, has done some work um, uh, sort of peripherally with L Lilith by looking at, at um, um, the dark of the moon and, and dark mm -hmm. goddesses in relationship to the dark of the moon. Um, but so, uh, let's see. It, it's kind of interesting, actually, that there are, you know, there's multiple Liliths in astrology. And so here you've got this, this kind of reviled feminine figure who has more representation in astrology than any of the male gods who supplanted her. <laughs> oh. I, I find that quite fascinating. So first we've got asteroid Lilith. Um, and she can represent this kind of youthful, rebellious, teenager side of Lilith. Um, but she can really come into her own as a warrior archetype. Um, her placement in the natal chart uh, can show us where we will never back down or submit and where we will fight for independence from an unjust authority. Well, being um, equal, yes, that really regulates that theme. That's a Yeah, and um, and aspects to the asteroid will show the archetype, archetypal energies that we enlist in that fight. Um, you know, and she's useful... But at the same time, I'm not. That's not going to be my focus in terms of uh, comparisons with the U.S. chart for for simplicity's sake. No, no, right. <laughs> um, Black Moon Lilith, who I mentioned before, is um, uh, she's lunar apogee basically. She's where the moon is furthest from the Earth in her orbit, and because the moon's orbit is elliptical, that orbit has two um, orbital foci. One is the Earth, and the other is an abstract point in, in space. That abstract point in space is Black Moon Lilith. And because that point moves around really erratically in, in response to these really complex gravitational forces, she's really difficult to pin down and measure. 
Um, so there's actually two versions of Black Moon Lilith. Um, this elusive, true, or osculating Black Moon Lilith, and then the Black Moon Lilith mean, which is the average of that point. Yes. Um, and um, some astrologers, myself included, use kind of the space between them as a corridor hmm. um, to understand um, how Lilith becomes this kind of point of transformation in our lives. Um, but for our purposes today, we'll, we'll just look at Black Moon Lilith mean because it's easier to track. Um, there's also Dark Moon Lilith, who is uh, also known as Valdemath's Moon. That's a hypothesized, oh, either a second satellite of the Earth or this kind of dust cloud in relation to this Earth, which is like this elusive shadow that um, has previously been spotted crossing the face of the sun from yep. our vantage point. Um, and that it, it's never been verified, um, but an awful lot of astrologers have used... Um, have have used Dark Moon Lilith um, and come up with some really um, valuable mm. insights. So I'm not completely dismissing her. Um, but again, because I'm not certain about whether or not she actually exists, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go with what we what, with what we actually know exists. <laughs> it is a, well, it's a good point. And I might interject here for the yeah. audience, too. She's a complex nature. So it make and with this long, sordid, rather history really, when you look at it, has real merit as equality. And equality in the sense of just its makeup, you know, the same intimate makeup, but also recognizing. So in other words, it makes sense that there are many ways of, uh, of describing, you know, in different ways. And, and it's, it'll be interesting to see how it's revealed more in time. Yes. Right. Um, and finally, there's a, there's a star um, known as Al-Ghul, um, in Arabic, Al-Ghul, the blinking demon. Um, yes, the similarity to the name of the Batman villain, Ras Al-Ghul, is uh, <laughs> not an, ac an accident. <laughs> um, it's a binary star that appears to blink when the darker star in the system eclipses the brighter star. And this star is considered to be the most malefic star in the heavens in multiple astrological traditions. Um, uh, the Chinese uh, call it uh, I'm probably mangling the pronunciation, but it means piled up corpses. Um, and it's referred to as Lilith by Hebrew astrologers. Um, and um, it's actually in placed in it's the blinking eye in the severed head of medusa wielded by the perseus com constellation so here it's this equated with another woman demonized as the result of patriarchal attitudes towards sex which i find very interesting well they are and it takes a lot to unravel them it's true yeah. even uh, medusa with all her snakes of of too many maybe directions of rebirth i don't know you know, I tend to look at things pretty broadly, but I haven't, it takes a lot. So, yes. So, we wanted to look at the at the U.S. Sibley chart and, and Black Moon Lilith Mean in relation to that chart. Yeah, let's pause here for a moment, partly okay. because we will have a little break. And I think that, so going back with Gilgamesh, and which is the first uh, real novel I mean, I love, I've, it's a wonderful piece of literature that is, I think, attested to be the first real literature or novel that was uh, printed or uh, written, not printed, but written. What well, was printed? It was handwritten, of course, back 3,000 years ago. And it was probably a story that lived many long years before that. But Inanna, which is also the name, and I'm doing this for our audience, is another name for Venus um, mm -hmm. of that time. And so, to me, uh, I've often thought of this idea of, like, why was this break? This break? And there are breaks. There's a lot, but th it's the same idea, I think, of just the whole chart. We start with Aries breaking away into a new direction, and then we complete with Pisces 
of the universal wholeness of the womb. Uh, it's not really of the womb, but of the wholeness of the universe. And so there's always this, these different uh, actions, you know, of breaking away and, and, and then connecting in all these different fashions. But I am hoping that by this strong Lilith of one of the wonder, of the true archetypes, I'll say true because it's equal, right? I mean, as you've denoted um, archetypes that we as a people will find this energy and re-describe our roles and our methods of working with each other because Inanna, okay, going back to Adam who um, demanded his his methods and more or less prescribed rather than working with this energy of Lilith, his equal. Um, I would think that going back 5,000 years ago, which actually isn't that far, there's, you know, people lived many thousands of years before that in so many ways, but that's when civilization writing and exchanging monies and government and all the tools that we have for society began in this evolution progression, whether we think it's great or not. And so perhaps having roles and rules were necessary, but yet there was a lot of debris, a lot of misunderstandings. So I'm so glad you brought up that 97, because I pulled that chart up, and it was 27 degrees of... uh, Anyway, it was an exact opposition at that time, and as you say, awareness. So now Lilith is conjuncting our moon. So well, we- actually, um, we're leading up to that. Um, it, she's not conjunct there quite yet. <laughs> no, no, this is true. Well, thank you, Madam Simon. After yes. this announcement, we'll be right back, and I'll look forward to it. Thanks. Okay. we take a break from this week's edition of Talk Cosmos, let's take a look at this cycle's archetype. We are currently in the Yang period of Aquarius, ruled modernly by Uranus and Saturn in traditional astrology by the ancients. By leaving a cycle based on governing structures through both man-made and universal laws, Aquarius breaks established patterns, permitting the energy of freedom, just as its ruling planet Uranus spins on its side and orbits backwards. As a fixed air sign represented by the water bearer pouring the spirit of cosmic energy, Aquarius seeks to find like-minded, intuitively aligned souls to connect in social groups for the elevation and improvement of all. Celebrate your star energy blessings. Schedule a natal astrology chart consultation with Talk Cosmos host, Sue Rose Minahan. You'll learn to better understand what personally fuels your soul's seed direction. Sue focuses on your questions to connect you into your unique heart's desire and your true soul path's birth essence, including a recording and a copy of your chart. Schedule by emailing info at talkcosmos.com. That's info at talkcosmos.com. Hi. This is Dan Cusel, Jungian psychotherapist and astrologer, and you're listening to Talk Cosmos on Alternative Talk, 1150 AM, where we explore the connections between the movements of the planets and the evolution of consciousness. Conversation you won't find on the rest of the dial. Alternative Talk, 1150. I was thinking of that. He has a great Oh, hello. Hello again. Talk Cosmos with Madam Simon from Bainbridge Island here in Washington, and we're talking about Lilith and the United States natal moon, 27 degrees Aquarius. Um, Yes, so um, there's actually a a few positions I would like to talk about um, in in the U.S. chart um, that have been impacted by Lilith in recent months leading up to um, her conjunction with um, the U.S. natal moon. 
Um, so we're using the Sibley chart, which is the primary chart used to describe the birth of the United States um, at 5.10 p.m. July 4th, 1776 in Philadelphia, uh, for anyone who wishes to follow along. <laughs> yes. Thank um, you. So the current Black Moon Lilith mean position is 19 degrees Aquarius. Um, and she stays at the same degree for about a week. Um, she entered Aquarius in August of 2018. Um, so we've been experiencing, um, the Aquarian version of Black Moon Lilith for yeah, a while now. Yes. Several months. Significantly. Um, so, um, the U.S. Saturn at 15 degrees of Libra in the 10th house, um, squares the U.S. Sun at 13 degrees of Cancer in the 7th house. And that's currently opposed by transiting Saturn um, in Capricorn. Okay. So. I, I'm just going to, I'm sorry, for myself and maybe other people, because there are non-astrologers, but mm -hmm. we're using, yeah, the uh, sibling, Sibley, 1776. And you're saying Saturn's in the seventh house? Okay. No. Um the U.S. sun is at 13 degrees cancer oh, in yes. the seventh house in that chart. Okay. And Saturn is at 15 degrees Libra in the 10th house in that chart. Got it. Um, and so the U.S. sun is currently being opposed by transiting Saturn, right? Um, and Black Moon Lilith Mean in Aquarius was trining the U.S. Saturn in late December. And this was starting, um, that started on the 20th, right before the beginning of the U.S. government shutdown. Oh, the 20th of January. No, of December. Oh, of December. Okay, just okay. clarify the detail because sometimes yeah. following, you know, the brain's going, thank you. Okay. okay. Yes. Important. And so this seemed, I, I was looking at this and this seemed strangely appropriate to me because one of the esoteric meanings of Lilith is learning through pain. Mm. And when you consider that Saturn is the classical ruler of Aquarius, you know, modern day astrologers will look at Uranus as the ruler of Aquarius, but I, I like to combine both. I like to look to both the, the classical and modern rulerships. Um, and so I find this really interesting because it seems like a trine between the US's natal Saturn in Libra and then transiting Lilith in Aquarius it seems like this perfect moment for the president to have initiated this kind of ill-considered shutdown that has, what has it done? It's generated a lot of pain and struggle for so many federal employees and the people who are negatively impacted by, you know, disruptions of service to things like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, okay? And so this is particularly apropos because the president hasn't gotten the results he wanted from the shutdown. And Lilith has this distinctly Uranian element to her insights, even when she's not in Aquarius, okay? So she's really adept at finding a way to teach us through pain that we did not anticipate. Well, so if, I, if I may, yes, and, and I might just say, too, that the reason is that Aranis, just for the audience here, Aranis disrupts and breaks up. Because Saturn is a structure, and so Uranus right. breaks that structure just as its, ellipt its orbit is goes backwards, and it, it's irregular. You know, it, it, it rotates on its side, its axis, rather than up and down. So those are just physical indications of it. But the, if we in life are not aware of these sudden changes, because it is of suddenness, too, breaking things up, that's where the pain comes in because I didn't right. want people be, to think, oh, it's always because it can be quite enlightening. But yes, oh, no, it yeah, definitely it doesn't have it, to be trauma. Pain. But you're right. Trauma yeah. is associated with it because yeah. people aren't prepared and they're like, oh, how do they put their pieces back together? Right. Right. But this is specifically um, it's more that this trauma is, is associated with the Iranian side of Lilith mm -hmm. is what I'm getting at. Um, and, and granted, she, okay. like yes. other dark goddesses, 
she's associated with the dark of the moon. And that occurred while Lilith was still in a one degree orb of the trine to U.S. Saturn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're doubling up on that energy there. Okay, and while trines are typically seen as flowing and supportive aspects, a Saturn Lilith trine during the dark of the moon um, really strikes me as increasing a flow associated with death and releasing. It, which is appropriate not only to the season, the winter season, okay, and the havoc caused by the government shutdown, but that also then leads into um, the emphasis on releasing that was provided by the January solar eclipse on the transiting south node, which had just moved from Aquarius um, into Capricorn. Um, and Capricorn is, just to interject, l right, limitations. So I agree that that trines can just be an easy flow more of the detriment, not necessarily the good. Yes. Right. Okay, so now, in order to understand Black Moon Lilith in Aquarius, we need to get some understanding about Aquarius itself. It's a fixed air sign. Uh, the air signs relate to thoughts and communication and social concerns, and fixed signs are at the heart of their element. They're stubborn and unlikely to move easily, okay? They're like, you know, kind of the truest version of their element. Yeah, they're coagulated. They have found <laughs> their form, yes. Right. And so Aquarius is concerned with thoughts and beliefs that we're not likely to change, the things that we're certain we know. And in um, the second house where the U.S. South Node is and also where, um, oh, goodness. Yeah, it's the U.S. South Node. I think the actual the it moon is. itself it is. Is, is just over the border into the third house. But yes, it is. the U.S. South Node, and remember, I was mentioning the South Node associations, the most recent eclipses, okay? Um, so the U.S. South Node shows us where our country has maybe some kind of fixed and outdated beliefs that we're stubbornly clinging to regarding, well, second house matters, which would be finances, possessions, and values. And and the somehow the, well, it's not entitlement, but it's elitism or it's because Aquarius can also, we all have our shadows part of it, but we want in betterment to elevate groups of people we have this humanitarian idea but it can also be elitism so yes in many ways well it can be subject to group think in particular um aquarius you know the modern day rulership of uh, by uranus reveals the potential for rebellion and eccentricity in the sign but that rebellion and eccentricity are within the context of saturn's traditional rulership Saturn governing structure and limitation, in this case, social limitations, the restrictions that result from social mores, from internalized expectations of, of others, from the law, from from mob mentality. OK, mm, yes. so Aquarius is about the relationship between the growth of the individual and the growth of society and how the evolution of the individual is necessary for and a means to the evolution of society. Right. Very okay? well put. Right. So Black Moon Lilith in Aquarius transited the U.S. South Node in October. Okay. Yes. We had that nodal return or reversal, actually. Right. Okay. Um, and in that process was asking us to get clear on what our true beliefs are regarding second house matters. Ah, now Rather we're getting than there. Just yep. blindly, huh? Oh, we're getting there. Yes, yes. Go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> Rather than just blindly accepting the economic ideas and behaviors that we've adhered to for so long with increasingly disastrous implications for the for the planet, for the feminine planet, right? Um, and remember that Lilith has millennia of experience <laughs> with rejection by this, by the, the patriarchal status quo. Okay. So when we're looking at this Lilith transit now, 
you know, it's all well and good for us to say that we should reconsider our values, especially with regard to our resources. Um, but now we've looked at, you know, what she's kind of stirred up about what we need to let go. And that's about to get extra impetus um, from um, Uranus's ingr upcoming ingress into Taurus. Yes. Okay. Where he's going to be for the next seven years. Yeah, okay. And I might, again, just remind people that in May, I think it was May 15th, because Uranus stays in its sign as it orbits around the sun for seven years. And it had just left Aries. And that was a significant time. There was the Arab Spring, exactly the day it's, it, it went into Aries. So it's not as though it forced that, but the energy was alive and that's how it transformed. And so now it's got retrograde, and that's the appearance from Earth back into Aries because it had, and now, as, as you're saying, Madam Simon, it's going to return into Taurus. Into Taurus. It was in, it had made a very brief ingress into Taurus in um, May, in 15th. May of yes. 2018, mm -hmm. um, which coincided with Pele's eruption in Hawaii. Yes, yes, okay? absolutely. Like, sure did. Again, you know, sudden disruption in a Taurian realm, which has to do with the earth and yes. our material resources. Okay. Mother Earth, yes. Um, so we got this kind of, you know, brief preview of the Uranus and Taurus experience um, in May. And we're about to, it's about to come back in March, okay, and last for the next seven years. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, I kind of feel like he was, you know, he moved back into Aries for a little bit to give us this last little, you know, push to our identity and courage. Um, because it's necessary to help us face the collective lessons of 2019 and 2020, particularly against the backdrop of the U.S. Pluto return, which is coming up um, in the kind of space between 2020 and 2022. Yeah, I okay. think, well, I think, the right, I mean, the, we're having several returns, very important for the United States, but Pluto, I think, is 23, 24. Is it 22? Maybe it is 22. At any rate, it is several years ahead, but it's, it, um, it's significant. And it's I, connected to the, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction and lunar eclipse on January 11th, 2020, actually. Well, um, oh, yes. And between then and 2022, um, it's going to oh, be... Oh, okay. And pardon yeah. me, you meant degrees. I was talking about years. Yes. So for those... I'm so sorry. If you were right here we, and we were going to... Uh, yes, January 12th or 11th, 2020. Yes, exactly. I was thinking Pluto is having a return some years later, I think in 2023, 20, 24, but you're talking about Saturn conjunction. No, no, I'm talking about the Saturn Pluto conjunction. Well, yes, that Saturn Pluto conjunction is the, next year. Exactly. One year. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, My okay. Listen, yep. I was thinking about <laughs> Pluto conjuncting itself because Pluto is going to do that, but that's not what you're talking about, but it's, the next phase, but we'll, well said. All right, go ahead. Pardon me. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, I, I, so when we're looking at this combination, um, you know, that, that we're, that we're heading toward that Pluto return, um, you know, when we've got this Saturn Pluto conjunction, um, coming up and it's Connection. really excuse me but I guess I have to clarify if it's it's not a return it's actually a, a, a Saturn Pluto conjunction right that's what we're talking about no we're talking about both the Pluto conjunction the Pluto return is the backdrop to all of this remember it's that kind of that long slow process right but okay. it will have okay at any rate since we're talking astrology that's all right we if we had the chart right here, we could say yes, no, and I'd understand. So I, I'll let you say your point. <laughs> I'm with you on this. It's just some of the details I get caught up in. Okay, thanks. Well, the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's the backdrop that informs the lessons that we need to learn from Lilith. That's why I'm bringing Sounds it up. Sounds good. Sounds okay. good. Yes. No, I'm with um, you. So we're looking at this kind of this... this um, 
uh, when Saturn and Pluto get together, they get all disruptive. <laughs> oh boy, yes. Well um, put. You know, there's you're looking at structure Saturn being transformed by Pluto, and in Capricorn, that's very much a material status quo kind of structure. Okay. Absolutely. And when you're combining that with Uranus in Taurus, disrupting um, and and bringing sudden change to our relationship with our material resources, that those both relate very much to um, you know the U.S. South Node being in the second house and uh, the lessons yes. of the second house that I was talking about, and you know Black Moon Lilith transit over that toward the end of, of 2018 um you know asking us to really consider what do we value and what do we need to let go in preparation for dealing with these disruptions um in our in our material world and in our political hierarchies and in our social structures okay it is the message you're absolutely right Okay, so um, now when we're looking at um, the U.S. moon at 27 degrees Aquarius in the third house, Black Moon Lilith is going to transit the the U.S. moon during the second week of April this year. So that's coming after that Uranus ingress into Taurus, okay, Um, you know, which will have given us that little kind of Uranian shakeup. And then Black Moon Lilith, like I said, has her own Uranian side, even when she's not in Aquarius. And that's being reinforced while she's in Aquarius. Okay. And so there's this, um, she can give us this insight into our emotions and our knee-jerk reactions, which is what the moon represents. Okay. Um, Particularly with regard to our communications, which is what is represented in the third house. Okay. Um, and you know, these are particularly the reactions that are coming in the aftermath of being confronted with how much our economic and value and material systems are in dire need of updating. Remember, Uranus is concerned with the future. (laughs) Yes. Elevating. Yes. Improving. Um, and Black Moon Lilith is concerned with us realigning ourselves with our deepest truths. True. Right. Yep. The that's an essential good point. It's essential. Okay. Yes. And and remember that um, the transiting nodal axis, the North Node is currently in Cancer, and the South Node is currently in Capricorn. Okay. The most recent eclipses, um, you know, touched that um, that Capricornian South Node. Okay, and Cancerian. Um, See, I follow all this, but you must, Simon, Madam Simon, remember too, people out there are not all astrologers. So just just as a viewpoint, that's why I jump in so much, and I apologize. But no, um, and you're just so clear, and I follow everything, and you're really elaborating beautifully. So I'm totally in support. But just remember, on some of it, um, uh, so. Uh, as far as the archetypal thinking here, and I'm just trying to remember what you just said, but about, because it is our emotions, you know, the moon does. So this is, it's not just, you're so right, that with Lilith, it comes with this sense of, 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 of sense of, well, the fact was is that she's truly part of nature. I mean, we, the equal energy and and how do we feel about all these emotionally um, traumatic changes to to our entire structures of 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 authority of laws of institutions you know, you're nailing it right okay but keep in mind that both black moon lilith in aquarius and the moon in aquarius are not particularly sentimental no, so that's true, this, too. They detach. They look at, yes. Okay, and there is this kind of combination with Black Moon Lilith in Aquarius 
of intuition and objectivity. Um, she's very much about gut instinct. What physically feels right. Okay. Um, it's a very kinesthetic knowledge. That'll go well along with Uranus in, in, in the earth sign, the sensual sign of Taurus, you know, so, which rules the, as far as the influence, the Aquarian Lilith. So that's getting to our gut. That's good. You know, just plain. It is good, yeah. and, but it's also in contrast to what's going on with the reason I brought up that north, the north node and south node. Um, the transiting north node is currently at 28 Cancer, and it's moving into a conjunction with U.S. Mercury at 24 Cancer in mid-March. So there's this karmic imperative that's going with the north node for us to communicate with sensitivity and vulnerability, these Cancerian themes, and this willingness to create communities of the heart. Mm. even as we're also being challenged to let go of old ideas and old knee-jerk reactions when it comes to our resources and our values. Well, it is a tall order, yet very healing. I, you've described, I love the word karmic and community of heart. That's just beautiful. And the attachment you know, the moon, regardless of what sign, has attachment. So letting go to kind of prune, and especially when they're, they're fault, well, they're, they're misguided, one might say, from this old heritage of, 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 of misplaced emotions, you might think, you know, with the rejection. Well, and misplaced actions and misplaced structures. Remember, Lilith is very much associated with activists, with artists, um, with rebellion, um, and with those who are marginalized by society. Um, you know, and one of the themes of both that Saturn-Pluto conjunction and the impending um, Pluto return is that the U.S. has some troubled history with regard to, you know, Native American genocide and African American slavery and the various things that we've done to create our material structure, our economic structure. Yeah, the loss of all the buffalo. Boy, that's a big one for me. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. That's so true. And I love the idea that the, the marginalized, as you put, voices have a purpose of course you know and really weren't we founded on people that were leaving a society to in order to live their own true sense of freedom you know so activists artists and voicing uh dissent in in, in our ways that we have a free speech it's vital it's it's ex that's really you've uh i really appreciate we will continue. I just want to remind people that next week we'll have a second uh, week of, of, of Aquarius. And Eileen Grimes, who is the host on KKNW of Jupiter Rising, will be the speaker. And we'll be talking about Aquarius and humanitarian uh, uh, with Uranus and all of its forms. So we'll have much to learn of that sort. And so tonight we've been speaking and we'll continue for a couple of minutes with Simon, with Madam Simon from Bainbridge Island in here in the state of Washington. And again, if you want to find out more about her, go to Talk Cosmos. There are archives always that we have, and that's on audio archives. But we have guests and you can locate her through her uh, her icon alchemy.com so we have about one minute i think so <laughs> i would be delighted and i've appreciated this entirely with you um madam simon so likewise yeah but i'll let you conclude uh, if you'd like or else i can too because really lilith is speaking to us now and as you say back since august 2018 
with the, so many elements of astrology, and for those that want to learn more about astrology, that's fine, but for those that just want to get the essential ideas of what this language is trying to tell us, and through the senses, I think that's one of the things you're saying, and I love that. That's something we can all connect with. Yes, um, Lilith's gut instincts, This is that's really what she's interested in us um, cultivating, and understanding, you know, getting clear within ourselves about what is the most honest and integrated path forward um, so that we can understand how we can move away from destructive and reactive emotional patterns of the past oh, and, and be more authentic about yes. our individual and collective values moving forward. And find that, and that heart. really fits with the U.S. moon in the third house. That oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. We have a heart community. I thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night. Thank you so you much. You too. Thank you for listening to Talk Cosmos, the show where Sue Rose Minahan and guests unveil astrology's ancient archetypes that continually build the collective experiences in our unconsciousness. Be sure to tune in next Saturday at 6 p.m. to continue finding your roots in the stars. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.